you also write about the declining numbers in political parties and you say other organisations haven't escaped that decline. You talk about the churches and Rotary and PNC and local sporting, uh, sporting groups. Why do you think that is? Have political parties become smaller and less representative of their constituents? Well, Alan, I think the, the non-joining mentality covers everything, not just political parties, but it has an acute relevance with political parties because they are the ones that produce the men and women who make the decisions. And we have seen in current generations a reluctance of people to join organisations. And as a result, you get an even heavier concentration of people whose only life's pursuit is politics joining political parties. Now, that can produce some outstanding people, but it can also produce a mentality that sees politics uh, as a game. Now, why is it that we've had so many uh, prime ministers on both sides in recent years? Is it because we have a greater number of people who see uh, politics in factional and game-playing terms rather than in long-term policy development mm -hmm. terms? Maybe that's an explanation. Yes. But, but I think it's, I mean, you, you, it's you highly dwell, relevant. You dwell heavily on this factionalism. Just a quick word from you on that. How much is that destroying the fabric of getting the very best people? I mean, you mentioned about Chifley with lawyers and two farmers, a dentist, a publican, a tobacconist. Uh, I think the only lawyer was H.V. Everett, wasn't he? Um, but, but how has factionalism destroyed the willingness of people to put their hand up? Well, it discourages people from nominating in the first place because if they're not chosen or ordained by a faction, they don't even bother. A long time ago, uh, when factionalism was less influential, uh, you had large fields in safe seats. I ran for two federal pre-selections. First one was Barara in 1971. There were 33 candidates, and I was one of the unsuccessful 32. I then ran for Benelong, and there were 25, and I was fortunate enough to win that pre-selection. You now, in very safe seats, you often see fields of fewer than 10, in one or two mm. cases, fewer than five. Mm. Now, that means something, doesn't it? It means that people see these things as tied up. I mean, how often people have come to me in recent times and said, oh, I'm thinking of nominating for so-and-so, such and such a seat, but I've got to bear in mind that this or that faction has already picked their candidate. Well, that is debilitating, it's discouraging, but worst of all, it's denying our party the opportunity of choosing some outstanding outsiders. You should always put into parliament a mixture. You need to put people in whose life's background has been uh, in politics, but you also need to put in people who've been outstandingly successful in uh, their chosen profession if, if, if we'd have had the factional system in the 1950s, we probably wouldn't have seen Sir Garfield Barwick, mm. uh, the great barrister of that era, go into mm. Parliament. Mm. You might not have yeah. seen Bert Evatt, mm. a High Court judge, step no. down and, and go in for the Labor Party. So basically you're saying factionalism has killed candidates. You're just one example of that before we go to a break. I mean, Joe Hockey was appointed ambassador to Washington. You say this in the book in 2015 by Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, North Sydney, blue ribbon, blue, blue, blue ribbon, Liberal seat, three candidates for pre-selection. When Joe Hockey had a majority of 16% for the reason that you've identified, people knew they had no chance. It had all been sorted out. I'm afraid that's correct. 